right, New Covenants, grab your Bibles, make your way over to Matthew 19. So, again, so glad you're here. Now, Matthew 19. So we're in a series. We're actually wrapping up our series called TD12. It is training day for the 12 disciples. And so if you remember, if you've been with us throughout this whole series, what Jesus is doing in Matthew 14 to 20 is this teaching us, training his followers to carry on the mission when he's gone. They have rejected him, and they have not just rejected him. They said the best thing that we could do for our country is actually to rid ourselves from him. They're going to kill him. And so he is preparing his disciples for how to carry out his mission. And so the mission isn't just for the first century disciples. This mission has continued on for centuries and centuries, and it's the same mission that you and I have. So, right? Buckle up. We've got ready to roll. Now, I'll just say this. Uh, I'm not going to get to chapter 20. So I'm, I missed a chapter. I went as fast as I could, okay? Um, and so we will come back to chapter 20 at some point. In your small groups, what a great chapter to talk about. It's about rewards, right? Your rewards. And so a uh, fascinating chapter that we won't get to today. All right. Chapter 19, though, we're going to look at what's, what does real Christian living look like? It's some challenging stuff. And so uh, Jesus, so in chapter 19, just so you know, when, when we start a chapter, don't think that just because there's a, a chapter that, one, that oftentimes we break things up and we don't see how things above it come and then how things after. Just because it's a chapter, new chapter, doesn't mean that it's just one lesson. And what we're going to see, there's m- actually multiple lessons in chapter 19. And Jesus is going to begin addressing marriage. He's going to look at marriage, right? He addresses the importance of faithfulness in marriage. Christian marriages should look differently than the marriages of the world, right? Christian marriages ought to look differently. And so we get the idea, um, is this relevant for us then as believers? Yeah, because oftentimes our marriages don't look any different. And so Jesus is going to challenge us right here. And so chapter 19, verse 3. We're jumping in. It says, Now some of the Pharisees came to Jesus. So remember, Pharisees, religious leaders. It's the pastors of the day. Some Pharisees came to Jesus with the purpose of testing him. And they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And so here we have these religious leaders. They're approaching Jesus, and they're coming with him with a common debate of their age and their day. Right? It's a hot topic. This issue that they're coming with is a hot topic. Rabbis at this time were divided over what was legitimate and not legitimate when it comes to uh, divorce. And there were two, primarily, there are two schools of thought. So if you're a note taker, here, here are the two schools of thought. There was the school of Shammai, and then there was the school of Hillel. And so Shammai, Shammai was a rabbi that said divorce is only permissible. It is only permissible when there's infidelity. Divorce is only allowable when there is sexual unfaithfulness. That's when we, someone can divorce. All other divorces are prohibited underneath the school then of Shammai. Now, but there was another rabbi, a well-known rabbi named Hillel. And he was a rabbi that taught that a husband can actually get rid of his wife for any, for any act of indecency. And so do you see the two schools of thought? Shammai says only when there's infidelity. Hillel, when there is any act of indecency, indecency. Now, which should beg the question when it comes to the the interpretation of Hillel, well, what does indecency mean? And where does actually Hillel get that? He didn't just kind of conjure it up on on his own. He actually gets indecency from Scripture. He gets it from Deuteronomy 24. In Deuteronomy 24, listen to what Moses writes. Moses is writing these words to the people of Israel. Israel. He says, if she, meaning the wife, if she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some indecency in her, and he he can then write her a certificate of divorce. 
And so right here, Hillel is interpreting this to mean indecency can mean anything. It's actually, it doesn't mean just sexual unfaithfulness. It means more than just infidelity. So in other words, a husband could dismiss and get rid of his wife for all types of reasons, right? If a wife was too loud, right? He could strip her off, send her away, right? Too loud, too loud. If a wife was too outgoing, too boisterous, I won't, I mean, we have loud women on staff here. I won't name any names, Lori. <laughs> right? Seth could dis- dismiss her. So if a wife was too loud, if a wife actually burnt the food, she could be dismissed and sent away. If a wife could actually, if she lets her look slide, a husband could dismiss her, could divorce her. And so in other words, you see something. Indecency, that word right there, incredibly flexible. I mean, you could divorce your wife for any types of reasons. It doesn't matter how trivial those reasons were. And so which school of thought do you think was more popular? Hillel. And so Hillel has a very, it was very popular in Jesus's day. And do people get divorced over trivial reasons today? Yes, indeed. And so it was popular, Hillel was popular then, and it's popular now. And so these religious leaders, they come to Jesus with this hot topic and they say, Jesus, what's your opinion? Which school of thought do you line up with? Who's correct? Is it Shammai? Is it Hillel? Shammai, Hillel, right? And they want to trap Jesus. Do they really care what Jesus says? No, because if he would have chosen the other one in just a second, they're gonna have another kind of response. But what Jesus says, like Jesus sides with Shammai. He sides with Shammai. And in actuality, does he really side with Shammai? No, he sides with what God has already revealed in scripture. And so what, let's see Jesus's response. Verse four, and Jesus answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? You see what Jesus does right here? Jesus just quotes scripture. He's quoting Genesis 1. And so just just kind of a little side note, a little little sermon within a sermon. It's not even a sermon, it's a statement, right? Jesus believes in a literal Genesis. He's quoting Genesis 1. And not just Genesis 1, he quotes Genesis 2 in verse 5. And he says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they no longer are two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And so what is Jesus doing right here? Jesus commands a couple to stay together. He's like, you stay together. Right? He's saying, you stay together because what God has brought together, you don't tear apart. There is a oneness that happens in marriage. Marriage is an institution that is given to us. It is a gift by God. It is an institution. It is a union between a man and a woman. And when they come together, they're not meant to be separated. It is a sacred, actually a sacred event. And so marriage makes you one. And we're not meant to tear apart what God has joined together. Now, whatever Jesus answered, remember, they're trying to trap him. They're trying to trap him. And so they ask, like, so then why, why does Moses allow for divorce? See that in verse seven? They said to him, the religious leaders said to Jesus, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Isn't that it? I mean, this is a very challenging passage. Jesus quotes scripture. He quotes Genesis 1. He quotes Genesis 2. But these religious leaders, they think they got him. Because what do they do? They quote scripture. They're quoting Deuteronomy. Did not Moses allow for divorce? What's what's going on there? And so Moses commanded that there there, there are things that they can do. Ways that they can divorce. Now look how Jesus responds. It is fascinating. Verse eight. And Jesus said to them, why was it allowed? 
Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. There is an exception. There has been a concession. Jesus' answer right here is so fascinating to me. Jesus says, God made a concession when it comes to divorce in the Old Testament. A concession that wasn't best. It's a concession that's actually not ideal, right? In other words, God saw the people in Israel. He saw their hearts and he saw that their hearts, they weren't soft and their hearts weren't malleable. And so he makes a concession. Uh, Maybe to say it, I'm gonna say it a little bit differently. God, did God see the nation of Israel as mature sons in the Old Testament? He didn't. You know how he saw the nation? Not as mature sons. He saw them as little kids, as little wayward kids. And that's not my words. What comes to my mind as I was looking at this text and thinking about this text, the words of the prophet Jeremiah come, come to mind. In Jeremiah 31, the prophet Isaiah is prophesying of a, of a new covenant that's coming. He says, a new covenant is coming, house of Judah. A new covenant is coming, house of Israel. And it's way better than the old covenant. It's way better than the law. And then he says some interesting words. He says, this new covenant is better than the old covenant. It's, it's better than the covenant when God had to take you by the hand and lead you out of Egypt. And this covenant is coming, I'm gonna write it on your hearts. Your hearts are gonna be tender towards me. He saw, God saw the nation as little kids. Who do you take by the hand, right? For you high schoolers, when you cross the road now on vacation, does your mom grab your hand? No, why? Because you're mature, right? What do you take? You take the little child, the one that you know is gonna dart right into oncoming traffic, that's who you take by the hand because they're gonna hurt themselves. And so right here, we see that God allowed concessions in the Old Testament when it, comes to the, when it comes to divorce because he saw their hearts. They were childlike, they were ignorant, and they were wayward. And so God permitted it. God permitted certain things that weren't best and weren't ideal. But just so you hear me, but, there's a but. He always governed how it's going to be done. He didn't just permit it and just let them do a free for all. He says, I'll permit it, but this is how now you're going to act accordingly. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, In the Old Testament, um, a man was to have how many wives? One, one wife, right? God gave Adam Eve. God didn't give Adam right, Eve and and Lilith and Gladys and a bunch of others, right? He gave him one, one wife. And yet, what do you see in the Old Testament? You see rampant polygamy. It's all over the place, right? Was that God's best? It was not God's best. It wasn't how that, it wasn't what he first intended. It wasn't ideal, but he did permit it but he also governed then how it was going to be done. That's why you see in the law, you see in Leviticus, you see in Deuteronomy that if you have other wives, this is how you treat them. And not just how you treat them. If you have offspring, if you have kids from another wife, that you don't get to just do with those kids what you want. Meaning God put up certain parameters and governed in such a way that you don't get to shirk your responsibility even though this wife might be a lesser wife that you love less. So God, it, wasn't, it was never, ever ideal or best, but God made concessions. He made concessions, but he always governed. He governed like how it was gonna be executed, how it was gonna be accomplished. Those are, this is a challenging passage. Let me give you maybe even another modern day example. Makes me, it may make some of you cringe just a little bit. Um, Let's just say, parents in the room, that you have a son and daughter, but this son and daughter that you love so dearly, you know they are disobedient and they are defiant. You have a son and daughter that you there, I mean, they are willfully, actually not just disobedient, but immoral. Yet you love them. You care for them. And yet they are hard-hearted. 
And you know, like they are living wildly. You're living wildly. Now, what might you say to a said child when you know that they're going out? You know what a common question would be, right? Do you have protection? Right? Now, when you say that, and in saying that, are you then now certifying sexual immorality? You have protection? Are you now like condoning the use of condoms? Right? No. If I were to say that to a child, does that mean that I'm like, oh yeah, just be moral all you want? No. Do you know me? Not at all. That is not what we're saying. Well, our desire as parents, what's our desire for our wayward children? Our desire then would be, oh, that they would be holy and pure, that they would walk with God. Right? Now, the reason that we might actually say what we just said, you know why we would say that? Because we still love them and we still care for them and we want to protect them. We would say statements like that that maybe some of you would cringe at saying, right? We say that, why? Because we're just trying to restrain the levels of their evil. And God is doing the same thing, right? He's just trying to restrain the levels of evil. And like, this is not ideal. This is not best, but I love you. And I long to protect you. So Jesus is, he answers it. He says, because of your hardness of heart, there was concessions. And so, but what is Jesus teaching us though? Jesus is training his followers, both in the first century and in the 21st century, right? We are a people that uphold marriage. We want to restore marriage He says, we are people that are faithful when it comes to marriage. We stay faithful to each other. We don't cut and run when things get tough. We don't punt when things get hard. We don't just toss aside our spouse if someone else just kind of gives us the warm fuzzies and shows us attention. No, we are people who uphold marital faithfulness. Right? We are restoring back to marriage what marriage is always meant to be. We're faithful to each other. Now, why is that so important? Why are we a people that actually are, like, we, are, we show the importance of marital faithfulness? You know why? Because marriage is just a picture of God's love for us. Does God cut and run when we do silly things? Does God punt on us when actually we're not faithful? Not at all. Right? When we are faithless, what? He remains faithful because he will not disown himself. And so as followers of Christ, he's saying we uphold marriage, the faithfulness of marriage. Right? And so I don't know about you, but verse, uh, verse 10 makes me chuckle. makes me chuckle a little bit. Look how the disciples respond to what Jesus just says. Um, as Jesus elevates marital faithfulness, they respond, if this is what marriage is, like, is it better not to marry? Should we just stay sting- single? Which then all the, I mean, like, look at what, how, like, a thought can permeate, like, society. Which interpretation do they gravitate towards? Shammai, like, just infidelity, or do they gravitate towards Hillel? Any type of indecency, just ship her, ship her off. They even, probably gravitate towards Hillel. And so they would prefer probably to have the idea of being able to cut and run and to release when their marriage expectations don't actually, when their marriage doesn't reach their expectation or their desires. So Jesus is saying, no, we remain faithful. Our marriages look differently. Now to wrap up the lesson, um, the disciples basically asked Jesus, is it better to be single? Is it better to be single? And Jesus is, I mean, we kind of just will fly by verses 11 and 12, um, and actually even fly by 1 Corinthians. I think Jesus and Paul says, if you can be single, it's better to be single. But the reality is, most of us in this room, like, like what 1 Corinthians says, uh, let, me just, let me just read it. I highlighted it. Most of us like, We're, that's, not, that's not me. But if you cannot exercise self-control, they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion, right? You're like, that's me. I'm burning with passion. So so what we do, we go right to verse 13, right? Let's go to 13. So we got another lesson. Jesus is gonna give us another lesson and it's just, and man, is it challenging. 
Jesus is going to show us he loves, Jesus just loves little people. He loves little, inconsequential people. He takes great delight in those that have been actually shown contempt. He loves those who are overlooked. Jesus takes, he just prizes the marginalized. And you see that in verse 13. Then the children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked the people. And so yet again, some children now are being brought to Jesus. And what do the disciples do? The disciples are not a fan. They are not wanting the children to come to Jesus. In fact, they rebuke the people who are bringing children to him. Like, stop it. Don't bring the children to us. Right? Why? Because they don't value kids. They don't value them. In a lot of ways, I'm reading this text, I'm like, man, they're like, they're like Mr. Wilson. Right? They see kids as like Dennis. Right? Dennis the menace right here. They don't want anything to do with these kids. Now, why are they so adamant to reject and to rebuke and to want kids to be cast aside? I'll, I'll keep it simple. Here's why they don't want kids. Because kids have nothing. Kids contribute nothing. Children accomplish nothing. That's just a reality, right? Do kids have anything? They don't have. What do they do? They take. Do, do children actually, actually accomplish anything? They don't accomplish anything, to which I say, that, that's not true. That's not true. They accomplish disruption and distraction and destruction. That's what kids do, right? Kids are needy. And kids want to take. And kids need blessing. That's what kids are. And it's no wonder, like the disciples are wanting to drive these children away. But notice the contrast. The disciples drive them away. What, are the, what does Jesus do? But Jesus says, let them come to me. Let the little children come to me and don't hinder them. For such belongs the kingdom of heaven. He laid his hands on them to bless them, to pray for them, and then he went away. The disciples, they want to ship these kids away. They want to get rid of them. And Jesus' mindset is completely different. Jesus thinks, you know what? Those who have nothing, those who contribute nothing, those who accomplish nothing, but actually, what do they want? They're just looking for blessing are precisely who heaven belongs to. That's what Jesus is showing us. Heaven is reserved for those that do not have, cannot obtain, and cannot achieve. Heaven belongs to those that can't bring anything on their own. That's what Jesus shows us. I mean, what a great lesson. It's a great lesson for them. It's a great lesson for us. Like Jesus right here, I mean, he is training his disciples that any and all can come to him. But who does he take great delight in? He delights in the littlest to come. He takes great delight in the inconsequential. He loves the little, the outcast, the overlooked, the inconsequential people. And most of us, I mean, we might love kids. Let's be honest. I mean, like we read this and be like, that sounds so foolish. I mean, we, lo we love kids. So many of you, I mean, you work with kids. You're in this service. Most of you in this service, you are in here because you are serving the kids in the past. And for that, we are so thankful. But here's the reality, right? Most of us aren't drawn to the little, are we? We're just not. We're, not dr we're drawn not to the little and the in inconsequential. We're drawn to the popular, the powerful, the prestigious. That's who most of us are drawn to. And so, um, notice what we see now. Don't break up this, what Jesus is doing I don't know how much time shifts between verse 15 and verse 16. I don't think it's a lot of time, but we're meant to see the connection. So verse 16. And behold, a man came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? What do I got to do? How do I get eternal life? Right? Do you see now? Do you see the connection between verse 16 and 13? I think we're meant to see it. Right? In verse 13, the children were brought to him. They're brought. In verse 16, a man is coming to him. 
there's a contrast, right? Those that are brought have nothing, contribute nothing, achieve nothing. And here's a man, he is not like those in 13. He's not like a little kid. He's not little, he's not inconsequential. This man is incredibly significant. In fact, we don't get told here, but this guy has a name in Luke chapter 10. It's the same event. If you go to Luke 10, you go to Luke 10, do you know what this guy is? He's a lawyer. He's not a small thing. He's a big thing in in their day. And so he has a name. He's He's not given a name in a text, but for those of us in this room, we were likely familiar with his name. It's a name that if you've grown up in the church, we have assigned it to him. You know what his name is? The rich, young ruler. That's who he is. And so right here, we're meant to see the contrast. This person is rich. He is powerful. He is young. He is wealthy. And so, do you think the disciples are deterring him from approaching Jesus? Are they rebuking him when he's coming to Jesus? They are not. They don't want the kids to come, but they have no problem with this wealthy person coming. And so, what could we learn from this? Here's a lesson. What you and I esteem and what you and I accept is not always what God esteems and what God accepts. What you and I value is not always what God values. And so, is this a passage? I mean, just that connection alone. Is this a passage that I think, I mean, I was thinking that, is this a passage that's relevant for middle schoolers and high schoolers? To me, this is a a massive passage for you guys. How so? Because do, do you as students, do you gravitate towards the popular, the smart, the good looking? Or do you gravitate towards those that aren't, aren't as good looking and aren't as popular? It's usually the latter. When it comes to, I mean, man, that's why if I were to ask the adults in this room, hey, if I could give you a ticket back to your middle school, high school days, how many of you would wanna go back? And I would say very few people would. Why? Because those days are hard and they're awkward. They remember how they were treated. And so, man, students have a way, like we just don't typically gravitate toward those who are just different, who are not like us. We will avoid them like the plague. And so this is a helpful passage, and not just for students, a helpful passage for everyone. And so notice what the lesson continues, though, verse 16. We're gonna learn this truth. Jesus is gonna show us how someone is gonna get saved. That's the question. What do I need to do to get eternal life? How do I make sure that I can have heaven? And Jesus is gonna show us, you know what? Salvation is only and always by God's grace. That's how you get heaven. You want eternal life? Salvation is always by divine grace. Always and only is what we're gonna see. The young man comes, says, teacher, what must I do? What must I do to have eternal life? What must I do to have heaven? What must I do? What must I accomplish? What, what hoops do I need to jump through? What rungs do I need to cross? All right, so this guy has a problem. I mean, it's a massive problem. It's not just a Jewish problem. This is a humanity problem. He has an heir already off the bat in his thinking. His heir is thinking that he can do something in order to gain eternal life. His erroneous thought is that, you know what? I can do things in order to please and placate God. That is a massive, that's not an issue of just then. That's a massive issue today. You ask your friends, hey, will you go to heaven? You wanna get into heaven? What do you need to do? I assure you, they start listing the things they have done or haven't done in order to gain access to God. And so Jesus is gonna, he's gonna talk to this guy. He's gonna show them, this is how you get saved. This is how you get heaven. And so in verse 17, and Jesus said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you were to enter into life, keep this commandment. And so Jesus starts exactly where he needs to start. 
he addresses with his first statement, who, who's good? Who's good besides God alone? And so right here, you have to realize, because Jesus doesn't respond at times how we think he's going to respond. He just says, who's good? He's, what he's doing, he's setting this person up. He's going to show them that what is needed then is actually needed today. He's going to show us is that everyone, no matter what, is not good. There is nobody who does good or is good. Everyone needs to know that they are they fall woefully short than what God needs or wants. In fact, the Old Testament and the New Testament speak to this idea. There is none good. There is none righteous. And so this guy's, I mean, answer, I mean, it's dead upon arrival. You can't do anything good. Only God is good, according to Jesus. Only God. Now, then he says those words, only God is good, but he says, if you want to enter life, you want life? You want life? Keep the commandments. That's odd. That's odd. I don't know about, I mean, that's odd to me. Why doesn't Jesus just say, you want, you want life? Trust me. You want life? Believe in me. Jesus doesn't say that. What does Jesus say? He says, you want life? Keep the commandments. So what, what on earth is Jesus doing? Right, keep the commandments. Keep the, why, why is Jesus doing this? I'll tell you why Jesus is doing it. Jesus is still setting him up. Jesus is trying to bring this guy to a confession. That's what Jesus is doing. Because what should this guy's response be? Right? He's just told by Jesus, you want life? Keep the commandments. And so here's a Jewish guy. He knows law. He knows what God has already spoken in the Old Testament. What should, his, what should he say? He should just look at Jesus and say, I'm not good. I'm not good. And I know I'm not good because I don't keep all the commandments. And so Jesus right here is trying to bring this guy to repentance. That's what repentance means. It means change the way you're thinking. You're not thinking correctly is what Jesus is saying. You need to change the way you're thinking. And you don't get life. You know you don't get life because you have not kept all the commandments. That's what the guy should say, should say. You know how we know he should say that? Um, one, um, do you know that God gave, when did God give the commandments? The commandments that he's gonna list in just a few seconds, you know when they were given? They were given in actually in Exodus 19. God gave all the commandments to his people at, 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 in Exodus 19 at Mount Sinai. We're, we're most familiar with what happens with the, the commandments he gives us in Exodus 20, which is, they're still at Mount Sinai, which is the 10 commandments, right? This guy should know, like, not just the 10 commandments, but all the commandments that God has given him. He should say, I, I can't keep them all. I can't keep them all. But you realize when God gave those commandments in Exodus 19 and Exodus 20 and all the commandments that he gave, you realize God never actually expected that they would be perfect. He never demanded that they be perfect. But God did expect them to be obedient. How do we know, without a shadow of a doubt, how do we know that God never expected his people to keep the commandments perfectly? You know how we know? Because we have a lot of things written after Exodus 19. We have way more in our Bible than just Exodus 19 and Exodus 20. In fact, you know what book comes after Exodus? Leviticus. Yes, Leviticus is where all of our Bible reading programs die. But do you know what Leviticus, you know why Leviticus is so important? Because Leviticus tells us, say, hey, when you mess up, when you actually break my commandment, this is how you regain fellowship. When you don't meet my commandments, which I know you won't, this is how you can know we are in right relationship. You're gonna sacrifice. You're gonna offer sacrifices to me. Something is gonna die in your place. Because of your rebellion, something needs to die. And so you will offer sacrifices. And so that's why, you see what Jesus is doing? He's just trying to bring out confession. 
He's just trying to bring repentance. He's like, if you want to live, keep the commandments. The guy should say, I can't keep all the commandments. How many, I mean, there's been countless offerings and sacrifices this guy has made in his lifetime. And yet, how does he respond? How does he respond? He says, which ones? Which ones? See that in verse 18? He said to him, said to Jesus, which one? And I think Jesus just said, if I were Jesus at this time, I would just do this like cosmic eye roll. Oh my goodness. Uh, Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. Honor your father and mother. How about this one? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All right? And this guy, I mean, just looks at Jesus. Like he has the audacity, like, check, done it. Done that, done that, done that. Now, clearly, and it t- part of me goes both ways. I mean, part of me says, man, you clearly did not see or hear Jesus on Matthew 5 when he, when he addresses those very commandments, right? You heard it say, don't murder. I'm telling you, if you have hatred in your heart, you're murdering. You've heard don't commit adultery. Hey, just so you know, when you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery. He clearly missed that message. Now, to be fair to him, had he likely murdered? Nope. Had he probably committed physical adultery? Nope. Right? But then I'm like, what about this one? I mean, like, really? Honor your father and mother? Did you keep that one perfectly? Come on. I bet he got a real good whooping by his parents at some point. Had to have. But how did this guy see all the commandments? He saw them as external. They're just all external. He never once thought about, hey, what's going inside my heart? And yet he knows, he knows deep down there's something awry and something missing. You know why we know that? Because he says, hey, I've done all those. I've done all those. All these I've kept. What do I still lack? I think he understands. He, deep down, he understands that he just falls woefully short of a holy and righteous God. But he is not willing to say, you know what, I'm not changing the way I'm thinking. What more do I just need to do? How can I placate, how can I please God by my efforts, and by my works? And then Jesus says, you know what, all this external things isn't working I'm gonna go right after him. Like, that didn't work. He didn't, he didn't confess. So I'm gonna go right after his heart. You got the external down? Great. Let's look at your heart. And he says, verse 21, Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. He's like, I want you now, All right? Get rid of your riches, get rid of your wealth, get rid of your power, right? And none of all these things that are evil in and of, in, of, in, of, in and of itself. But what is Jesus doing? He's saying he's going right after what's supreme in this guy's heart. He says, you know what? Punt those things. All those things that give you value, give you worth, give you significance, give you identity, you got to get rid of them. Come follow me. And then verse 32 When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And he was talking a whole lot up until this point. Yep, done that, been there, done that. Perfect, check, done. He gets to this point where God says now, Jesus says, sell everything you got, come follow me. What does he do? He's silent. He's silent before God. So we got, I mean, this is a challenging message but it's a very clear message. Jesus is showing us how, how do we obtain heaven? How do we have eternal life? How do we have access with him forever? It is not by your external actions. It's not by your performance. We have life, how? We have life when we come to him like a child. He takes great delight in those who come to him and says, you know what I have? I got nothing. I have nothing, I can accomplish nothing, I can achieve nothing, but man, do I want blessing? I want blessing. And God says, you, you're 
perfect for the kingdom because I'll do everything for you. Salvation is always and only by God's divine grace. Salvation is by grace and grace alone. Nobody in and of themselves can be saved. None righteous, no, not one. And he basically from the New Testament is very clear from basically the, the head to the mouth to the very tips of our toes, all of, I mean, we are woefully lacking. We are corrupt. We actually are. We are corrupt to the core. But God, Jesus says, man, you can still have life. And it's not based upon your resume. It's not based upon your performance. It's what I can do for you. It's a gift of grace. That's great news. It's wonderful news. And what's interesting as we kind of conclude our series is that this is the message that they're gonna proclaim when he's gone. Because in just a little while, in chapter 21, he's going to Jerusalem and he's gonna suffer at the hands of men and be delivered over. And he is gonna die. And he is gonna be raised like he said he would, but he's gonna ascend. And he's gonna go away for a little while. And these guys, his disciples have a mission. And what's that mission? To proclaim that very message. This is how you're saved. This is how you're made right. It is a divine act of grace for those who will come. It's the message they proclaim. And guess what? It's the same message you and I will proclaim. Until Jesus returns, and I promise you, he is going to return. He will. You can write it down. It's as sure as the coming of the dawn and the setting of the sun. He's coming back. But until he comes back, we herald that same message. And it's got a message, and it's got a name. It's called good news. It's called the gospel. And we can share, you want life? You want life. You want forgiveness. You want eternal, you want to be eternally with God forever? You don't come with your own efforts. You come, and it's by a sheer act of what God has done for you. For you. So, great news. Great news of good news of great joy just like the shepherds see next week when we talk about the Christmas story. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word is amazing. Huh. It's amazing to us. It is an aroma. It is a sweet smelling aroma to those who are your children. But man, for those who do not know you, it is actually still a stench that we as humans do not like to be told that we can't come by our own efforts by our own doings. We don't like to be told that all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. And yet, and yet they are. Um, and so, Father in heaven, my, my prayer is that you would use us as your people, give us boldness to proclaim this message to our family, to our friends, to our coworkers, to our classmates, that we have a message of great news that there is life and forgiveness and not just forgiveness and not just cleansing, but a perfection that can be credited. Oh God, give us boldness to share that. If there's anyone here in person, if there's anyone online listening that have not trusted Spirit of God, show them that all they need to do is just embrace and trust that Jesus died for their sins and rose from the dead. And there they have life. And all God's people said, amen.